Hi friends, thanks so much for joining us tonight as we continue our Integritas Forums. These interview style conversations, which occur once a month throughout the academic year, are intended to provide you, our Soren Fellows, opportunities to hear from and engage with successful professionals from a wide range of sectors, business, medicine, architecture, law, engineering, about their experiences and reflections on maintaining personal and ethical integrity across their professional, familial, and faith lives. These conversations will range from considerations on work-life balance, growing in the faith after college, vocational discernment in family life, and practical insight into professional development. The inspiration for this event is really twofold. First, in all that we do through the Soren Fellows Program, we seek to elevate the relational character of your formation and resist the reductively transactional paradigm so characteristic of modern university education. These conversations are intended to allow you to get to know and learn from someone rather than learn something or some abstract set of ideas apart from personal narrative. And second, as you well know, the DeNicola Center is proudly a scholarly center at a research university. But we also recognize and embrace that the majority of students we engage through the Soren Fellows Program will not have careers bound to academia, but rather will be scattered across a variety of public and private enterprises, whether through finance, medicine, research, law, and the like. Many of you will also be moms or dads, husbands or wives, good friends and counselors, community leaders, clergy, or religious. In the relational spirit of the center, we hope these conversations provide you opportunities to glean practical advice and enduring insights from persons who display virtues of truly integral formation, whether they work in the field you hope to enter, have a similar vocational path or not. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, these conversations would best take place in person over LaCroix and Rocco's Pizza, which we of course plan on moving forward once our shared life together regains some normalcy. But in the interim, we will host these online, which will allow you to access and revisit this content at your own leisure, whether in your own dorm room or on a walk around campus. The format of these conversations will be as follows. I'll interview our guests for about 30 minutes, covering topics from professional advice to personal discernment and everything in between. Then we'll be joined live by our guests so he or she can field questions from Soren Fellows that arose out of our conversation. That'll run for about 20 minutes or so. With that said, it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our guest this evening. Dr. Kate Callahan is a family physician at Memorial Hospital here in South Bend, Indiana. She's a 2012 graduate of Notre Dame, earning degrees in the pre-professional studies program, as well as theology. After graduation and a year of service here in South Bend, Kate enrolled at Vanderbilt University for medical school, where she discerned her professional vocation in family practice. Kate completed her residency at Memorial Hospital last year, serving as its chief resident, and this year is in her fellowship year with Memorial. She is passionate about providing care to underserved populations, particularly those here in South Bend, and has completed Memorial Hospital's services management curricula as part of her formation. She's also now pursuing a master's in public affairs through Indiana University. Furthermore, she serves as an adjunct professor here in the College of Science at Notre Dame with a particular focus on compassionate care in medicine. In 2019, Kate received the American Academy of Family Physicians Award for Excellence in Graduate Medical Education, one of only 12 residents recognized with this award nationally. Dr. Callahan's other accomplishments are nu numerous and include earning the Leonard Toe Humanism in Medicine Award and being named one of South Bend's 40 Under 40 for the year 2020. Though Kate is a native of Iowa City, Iowa, we're glad she now considers South Bend home and we're delighted to welcome her back to campus for this conversation. As a reminder, Dr. Callahan will join us for a live Q&A immediately following, so please type your questions into the chat function via Zoom throughout the conversation, and we'll get to as many as we can. Well, Kate, thank you so much for joining us tonight to share in this conversation about your, your story, your story at Notre Dame, your story into med school, your story into being a, a physician. Just grateful for you taking the time to chat with us tonight. Always a pleasure to be with you, Pete. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Well. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, where are you from? Where did you go to school? What are you What are you doing right now? Yeah, so I grew up in Iowa, in Iowa City, uh, which is a town really not unlike South Bend in a lot of ways. It's about it was about thirty thousand people when I lived there. It's bigger now, and then there was about thirty thousand undergrads. At the University of Iowa is there. Uh, hmm. My dad is a physician, uh, so he practiced at the University of Iowa. Great place to grow up, big enough that there was always a lot of things going on with the university there, but small enough that I felt safe kind of doing just about anything mm -hmm. as a kid and really rich experiences culturally and academically. Went to public schools, but had just a top class education in our public school system. I then from there uh, came to Notre Dame 
Uh, in 2008, I started at Notre Dame and graduated in 2012. I pursued a degree in theology in addition to doing my pre-med requirements, which I remain so grateful for to this day. Mm-hmm. And then I really struggled to make the decision about going to medical school for a variety of reasons that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later here. But in light of that, I hadn't really made a decision on whether or not I was going to become a doctor and drug my feet long enough that I couldn't go right out of the shot, uh, in part because of how well prepared Notre Dame has us and Mm -hmm. the number of requirements that need to happen almost a year in advance. I just was behind the eight ball by the time senior year came around. And so decided to put that off for a year, stayed in South Bend, did a year of service working with an organization called Young Life, uh, which is a nonprofit outreach to high school students predominantly, but I mostly worked with Notre Dame students and St. Mary's students that wanted to lead in local high schools. And then I also worked with the St. Peter Claver Catholic worker movement Mm. here in town as well. Uh, Such a valuable experience that year really grew me as a person, as a person of faith and I think has been invaluable to my career as a physician as well. Mm. Went on to Vanderbilt for medical school in Nashville, had just a really rich experience, not only educationally from a a scientific perspective, but also formationally. Mm. And then had the great gift of coming back here for residency and just graduated in July, in June rather, uh, started my fellowship year at Memorial Hospital's Family Medicine Residency Program in July. And my fellowship is a combination of things. It's a little bit of clinical work, some teaching, and then I'm finishing a master's degree in public affairs, which is kind of a combination between some public health aspects, some health administration aspects, and a little bit of political science as well. So that is what brings me to today. That is fantastic. Thank you for sharing, friend. Um, A great uh, example of, um, I think, the value of that of that gap year, of that service year. It's not even a gap year. It is, it is a service year. It's a very meaningful year between the kind of very rigorous kind of pre-professional formation and that that kind of standard end goal of med school. Um, and in South Bend, there are just so many ways to, to be involved, whether through the universities or certainly at the Catholic Worker. Um, so, but glad to have you back from Vandy. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Um, so I want to go back. So you're you're a domer. Um, you you did your undergrad here, um, and you were a double major uh, in pre professional studies and theology. One thing that I think um, Soren fellows deal with a fair amount is having a having a passion for a discipline that that they discover um, or that maybe was more latent in high school, but it's rediscovered in, in college. So say it's it's theology or history or something like that. But at the same time, they're they're thinking about and have these kind of career um, plans in, in some sense, like I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, whatever. Um, and those two kind of operate in, in concert with one another, um, but sometimes are in tension with one another throughout undergrad of the, the, the thought of being like, well, I'm really passionate about theology, but I've always wanted to become a doctor. Could you take us through that experience for you uh, throughout undergrad? How did you, how did you navigate that? Where were some of the the, the pressure points, but what were sort of some of the moments of clarity in that? How does how does the student navigate that that fruitfully? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Pete. That was something I wrestled with for the entirety of my time at Notre Dame. My freshman year, I came in as a biology major, actually, and really had a lot of presuppositions and assumptions that I had made about what made a good pre-medical student and what mm-hmm. was going to set me up to get into medical school. And I wanted to make sure I was checking all of those boxes and pursuing a degree in biology just seemed to be the thing that would allow me to do that. And it became pretty clear within the first month or two, honestly, of being a student here that that was not where my passion lay. Uh, I took a biology course my first semester and also, I believe by Providence, was put into my introduction Foundations of Theology course that same semester. And in that, I realized that that was the class I was going to office hours for every week not because I didn't understand the content, just because I was so interested in it and I had so many questions and the, I felt like we were just scraping the tip of, mm. of the surface, honestly, in that course and just found myself thirsting for more. And my biology course was fine. It was you know, a necessary part of my education, but it wasn't something that got me jazzed, that really mm. got me excited about learning, about doing the reading, about about just doing the work for the course. Mm. And I got to about midway through my second semester at Notre Dame 
and was starting to meet some folks that were pursuing arts and letters pre-professional studies degrees. That was the term. I think it's called pre-health now. I'm not exactly sure, Mm -hmm. but essentially a way to get a BA, a Bachelor's of Arts, while also doing the bare minimum pre-med science requirements. And as I met with those folks and talked with them over and over in conversation, they kept saying, "Why? what are you doing? Why are you a biology major? The things that you love, the course titles you get excited about are all in theology. Uh, and this is, you know, this seems to be the place where your passion lies, as you, as you said. And thankfully, with the encouragement of a lot of friends and, and through a lot of prayer, was able to come to a place of saying, maybe this isn't the clearest, straightest box checking path for going to medical school. But number one, this is me being true to who it is that God has made me to be, to pursue this degree. And also in that recognizing if I shut the door on this, there's no way I'm ever going to have a chance to study this in this way again, uh, given that I really do feel called to medicine. And so that was the first really important decision. And I think the big takeaway from that was And what I would encourage students to also is that we just have to be who it is that we are, you know, trying to fit into whatever mold we think we ought to be in order to get to a certain outcome. For me, that was a suffocating kind of paradigm to try to live in. And so my encouragement would be, you know, take the time to do some self-reflection and think about, you know, what, it, what is it that gets me excited? What wakes me up in the morning? What are the things that I just am so thirsty for intellectually? What are the things I'm curious about? And follow those things, uh, trusting that that ultimately, you know, as a person of faith, I believe that's how God has made me. And if God has also made me to be a physician, there was kind of this act of trust of saying, mm-hmm. If you've put these desires in me and you also have for me to walk down this path of becoming a doctor, I just have to trust that those paths are going to somehow come back together at some point. And so thankfully, honestly, this is one thing that I think Notre Dame does so well is that they offer all of these different avenues through which a person can maintain those bare minimum requirements to move on to the next step of medical school. Mm. So for me, that was super beneficial that I didn't feel like I was shutting the door on medicine. I just felt like I was picking up this extra torch that I could carry through on the path. And that's really what theology became for me. It became a light onto my feet, you know, a way of seeing the world uh, and honestly seeing the work of medicine. And I say not infrequently that if I hadn't studied theology, I don't think I could do the work that I do in terms of encountering the suffering of the people that I encounter, encountering my own suffering and my own loss and my own grief in the work that I do. I don't think that I could hold the weight of that on my own. And it's really a vision of the kingdom and of life with God and a belief that Jesus really is making all things new that allows me to enter into these spaces of tremendous darkness and weightiness and say, there's something else going on here, whether or not I can perceive it is really irrelevant. The reality is still true. And so throughout my time at Notre Dame, honestly, you know, my, my sophomore, junior year, those were years of really wrestling with the question of, am I called to medicine or is this really my dream? Or is this a dream that was, that I felt like I should walk into or that other people seem to think I was fit for? Uh, Is it really something coming from an, an interior place or is it something that exteriorly I feel like has, I've tried to put on that doesn't really fit. And thankfully, you know, I had space and time during my time as an undergraduate to sort through some of that. And I think really sitting with that tension and trying on other hats, you know, trying on teaching in some ways, trying on engaging in this really rich theological intellectual work, but also recognizing sitting in a cubicle and just pounding it out on a particular idea that's just not what brings me to life. I need relationships, I need people. And then also recognizing that it's not just relational encounters. I had the opportunity to do, to be engaged in a lot of ministry activities, um, to, to lead various ministry teams. Uh, the work that I did with Young Life was absolutely in that vein as well. And recognizing like, I, I love stories that will forever be the most important thing for me in terms of relationships and, and encountering people, but also doing things with my hands and thinking through problems that had some kind of concrete objectivity about them. And, Medicine allowed for that. Uh, There's lots of different paths within medicine, nursing, PT, being a physician, those kinds of things. But recognizing, no, I do think that this 
part of me is really important. This is part of who God has made me to be. And so then it was kind of sorting through those various professions and saying, which one of these really fits. And oddly enough, studying for the MCAT was one of the most formative experiences in that of just being moved to wonder at the intersections and the interplay between various organ systems and kind of marveling at God's incredible just thoughtfulness and creativity in crafting the human person and crafting the human body Mm -hmm. and recognizing these are the problems that actually engage my mind in the way that Mm -hmm. I want it to be engaged. And Mm -hmm. while there are lots of different pathways to pursue science and to pursue helping professions, for me, being a physician was what was going to give me that in-depth look at pathophysiology and to really deeply understand disease processes in a way that I felt like was most attuned to who it is that God has made me to be. So I think Mm -hmm. the biggest kind of pitch in this that I I would give to students is, and, and I do give to students when I talk with them is, is saying, you know, physician know thyself or like Christian know thyself is so important in this process. Because if I don't have awareness of the way that Jesus has made me and the things that I'm actually been, I've been gifted to do and the purpose that God has placed upon my life, it's so difficult to then sort through all of these external decisions that have to be made. But if I, if I can get straight about that, and if I can have a a sense of centeredness and prayer about that, then the, the decisions then become just opportunities to live out my yes to whatever that interior kind of discernment has been. And, and that honestly, that interior discovery in some sense of, Mm -hmm. of the work that God has already done in informing me and, and is ever presently doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kate. That has, I think, such resonance, uh, certainly for those who are, uh, you know, planning on on kind of thinking about medical school or whatnot. But I I also think it's equally transferable in in, in some sense to those who are discerning careers in in finance or consulting or Deloitte. Those kind of baseline fundamental discernment questions, um, you know, need to be placed in context with um, those actual practical skills that are required, um, the kind of the checklist of things to get from point A to point B, and they they depend upon one another. Um, and it's, it's not unique, you know, to becoming a physician. Um, it, there's an equal process of d- discernment and kind of discovery um, for those who want to enter, yeah, business or engineering or teaching or whatnot. And that is something that I think Notre Dame does provide a, a really strong apparatus for. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I, I want to touch on something else that kind of leads into my next question, which is a little bit more of a practical question. And I think that's what this conversation is going to be kind of bouncing back back and forth from is this kind of deep discernment and the practical decision making and how they rely upon one another to cohere in some sense. You know, as you think about your preparation for the MCAT and those practical decisions and that practical preparation that needed to be made, when you look back at it, what were some elements uh, of that of that process on a very practical level um, that that kind of stand out to you as something that it was really important that maybe didn't pop off the page in the process of, you know, studying or preparing or making the the arrangements in some sense that you think you know students might might do well to be attentive to. Yeah, great question. I think that that process, just as you named, can be so overwhelming. Uh, Again, I found myself going into the process of studying for the MCAT and preparing for medical school applications with this sense of the weightiness of these external expectations that I felt like everybody around me was talking about. Advisors, professors, my peers, just constantly, this was in discussion of, oh, these are all the things I need to do. This is my checklist. I'm behind on it. I haven't met the dates that I thought I was going to meet, et cetera. And honestly, for me, one of the most freeing things in deciding, you know what, I'm not going to do this right out of the shot of undergrad was then I was removed in some senses from that pack uh, of folks that were my, my peers that were making that decision of just saying, you know, I'm going to opt out of this for, for a moment and pause and, and recognize like, this is too much for me right now. You know, as a junior, when that kind of laundry list of things came out, there was this moment, I remember vividly remember sitting in one of these kind of big Jordan Hall classrooms with Dean Kohlberg and Father Foster sitting at the front of the room going through this extensive list of all of these things that needed to be attended to and thinking to myself, I'm not ready for this. This is way too much for me right now. And I think, you know, 
if you had told me that as a freshman, that that had been my response, I would have thought that that was just the weakest, most, you know, underformed, unprepared kind of response to a situation that a person could have. And so I think the, the first thing I would say about that is, you know, if we find ourselves in a situation where the things that we think we should be doing process wise aren't aligning with what's happening interiorly, I think that is an invitation from the Lord to pause and just say, mm-hmm. is this really the right time for this? Or am I being invited to do something else before I move down this path? So that's one big takeaway. Um, a second thing is that I knew about myself that I, I am not a good standardized test taker, never have been, have never enjoyed them. They stress me out. I am very anxious about it. And so in that sense, there was a lot of people around me saying, well, you should do this over the summer when you really have nothing else going on. But I also know about myself that if I only have like one thing on the docket, I just perseverate on that. Mm perpetually. And it's really problematic because then it's just consuming every waking second of my life. And so I actually made the decision to take that in the middle of the school year. I think I ended up taking it in March or something of my junior year. And in light of that, I really feel like, you know, again, on paper, that maybe looked like an unwise decision, given that I know I'm not a great standardized test taker. And I'll also say, you know, I didn't have a lights out MCAT score by any means. However, I think by doing it in the middle of the school year, when I had friends around, when I had community around me, people that could hold me accountable, that could check me when I was in a, you know, a spiral of self-doubt and questioning, that was huge. Another huge thing was, as I mentioned, you know, there were various organizations and, and ministry groups that I was a part of on campus. And I couldn't just shut those things off for two months while I studied, you know, I had commitments that I had to attend to and I had people that I had to be present for. And I think that was super helpful, uh, again, to kind of have those parts of myself woven into that preparation was huge. And then, and and then thirdly is that, you know, and this wasn't, my prayer life waxed and waned in undergrad. It waxes and wanes now. It doesn't look perfect all the time. But I do think committing to certain practices, even for five or 10 minutes during that time was so important for me. And, and for me, it was honestly just perpetually kind of laying this dream in many ways of being a physician before God, literally every day, just trying to offer that before God. Uh, at that, that particular season of my life, I can remember praying I'm sure you could pray this prayer better than me as an, as an Ignatian uh, follower yourself, but, but Ignatius has this really beautiful prayer about surrender um, where I says, I think he says something like take Lord, receive all my Liberty. My My memory, my understanding, my entire, my entire will. Yes. Right. That prayer. So that was a prayer that had been given to me by a spiritual director at the time. And so that was something I prayed pretty much every day going into the MCAT. And, and honestly, that was, that just really helped center me of saying like, I am surrendering all of this to you, God. And if, if I really do that, if I can really sit with my hands open before you, then I can trust that whatever you give back to me is, is gift, whether it's the gift that I want or not. Uh, And honestly, joke, somewhat jokingly, I used to say to people all the time, well, maybe I'll just blow the MCAT and that will be my sign that I'm not supposed to be a physician. And the fascinating thing was I scored like just above the threshold of where I would have felt like I needed to take it again. But again, it was not an impressive score, you know, by the numbers. And I remember thinking to myself, Oh, the irony Lord of this moment, because it was really humbling in a lot of senses. And also I felt in a, in an odd and mysterious, but beautiful way that this was God's invitation to saying, I want you to do this and I want you to walk down this path, but it's not going to look anything like what you think it's going to look like. And that has been a recurring theme, I think, throughout my walk with Jesus in general, but certainly throughout my walk with Christ in the midst of Mm. becoming a physician. So again, surrender, I think questioning in those moments where the external expectations are not meeting my internal posture, kind of using that as a, as an invitation to pause and say, is this really the right time to be doing this? Mm -hmm. Um, and then ultimately welcoming the Lord into those spaces. And, and there's, there's hard work, you know, there's hard work to be done in the preparation of that. I'm not trying to minimize those things, but I think Notre Dame students know that full well. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think those are the things that are pounded into us that you've got to put the time in, you've got to have some kind of systematic approach to how you're going to cover this content. Uh, but ultimately I think, these more intangible interior things 
are things that don't come up in conversation as often. So those feel more important to mention. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, friend. Yeah. And anytime I can get someone to begin reciting an Ignatian prayer during <laughs> one of these conversations, it's, it's well, well worth it. I was afraid for a moment that I actually wouldn't know what you're talking about, uh, but luckily that I knew you would. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I studied theology here too. No, <laughs> fantastic. Thank you, friend. Um, so you did your med school at Vandy, um, you know, without getting too far into the weeds about what your experience was, was like there, just as you look back in retrospect, what's one thing you would tell yourself on the first day of med school, um, you know, today, um, like buckle up for this because it, it's going to be like this, even if you don't expect it, or this is going to be a fruit that you aren't expecting that, that will be present if you're attentive to it. What, what would be one thing that you would tell yourself and, and maybe tell another you know, Catholic student on his or her first day of, of med school? Yeah, such a good question. You know, I, if, if I could go back and tell myself anything, I think what I would say is, again, this is going to sound redundant, but just be who it is that you are. You know, don't try to be who you think a Vanderbilt medical student is. Because in a lot of ways, I didn't really fit that mold. You know, I can vividly remember our first day of, of lecture we were assigned to these various groups and they lined us up by major. Like it was like, it was like picking teams for dodgeball in, in <laughs> kindergarten. You know, it's horrible. But so all of the like non-science majors got put at the end of the line. There was eight of us in our whole class that had, didn't have a BS. And those ended up being like seven of my best friends, you know? <laughs> and honestly, there was this sense of like, I don't fit here. I'm not good enough for this place. I don't have the stuff that I need to be able to do this. But again, what I would go back and tell myself is you didn't do this yourself. Like Jesus brought you here. You didn't, you didn't make this happen. Like your MCAT's like 10 points below the mean or something like crazy like that. You know, there's all of these reasons why I shouldn't be here. And yet this is the place that God has brought me. Mm. And so trusting that, you know, just trusting the process of Jesus's guidance and saying, you led me this far. I'm not, you're not going to leave me. I'm going to trust that you're going to stay with me. Um, so I think that, that would be a huge thing I would say. And then the second thing is every season, I think as a disciple is impossible to walk alone, but certainly these seasons where there is just so, there's so much difficulty and so much transition and, and so many really challenging experiences that happen and that are just incredibly humbling you know, I think those moments are when we really need our brothers and sisters in Christ to mm. remind us of, of who Jesus is, who we are, what we're made for, the story that we find ourselves in. And honestly, that was one of the greatest gifts that Vanderbilt gave me was just an incredible community of believers, uh, both Catholic and non-Catholic Christians and people that really just spurred me on in life with God and helped me believe that my identity as a disciple and follower of, of Jesus is not separate from my identity mm -hmm. as a physician and a healer. Absolutely. So Thank find you. Find those people, friend. seek them out. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and that is, I mean, uh, the, the final line that you ended on is I think in, in so many ways sums up um, what I think the Danicola Center and Sword and Fellows program tries to do is that there is kind of an integral idea of your identity where you don't uh, need to check your, um, faith identity, your, your being made in the image and likeness of God at the door before you begin to look at your charts um, with, right. with a patient. Um, and and I, I think that it, in whatever sector, in whatever profession, is, is a very easy kind of tendency to, to fall into, uh, to kind of put things in very neat and tidy columns. Um, but I think you kind of do that, not you particularly, but someone does that at, at their own peril because it is hollowing out who you are. Um, and so, and it does then require kind of practice though, too. It's, it's like, it's like a sport, you know, it's like shooting free throws is my example. You shoot a hundred free throws a day. You're going to be better when the game's on the line, you have to make two, right? Um, the more we habituate these things, kind of the easier they, they come to us. So absolutely. Thank you, friend. Um, so a lot of our conversation has kind of, um, kind of worked around kind of, um, discernment and, and kind of, um, being introspective in these ways that allow one to see clearly. Um, I kind of want to turn the page a little bit to like the, the nitty gritty of the day-to-day -day life of someone in residency or someone in their fellowship here. Um, like what 
what does a day in the life of you look like? And is there a day in the life of Dr. Callahan that looks the same as the day before? Almost never, which is part of, so I'm a family doctor. Uh, I was trained in family medicine. And part of what I love about family medicine is that it is different every day. You know, the diversity of patients. I see people, I see patients that are literally a day or two old, sometimes hours old, all the way through to, you know, I just saw a 93 year old patient a couple of days ago. And so it, there's this incredible breadth of experience and encounter and disease pathology, honestly, that just gets me really excited about the work that I get to do. It's never boring. You know, I, I, a, fr- a phrase that I say all the time to the folks that I work with, particularly when we're in the middle of just a crazy situation that all of us feel a bit overwhelmed by is it's never dull. You know, the work yeah. that we do is just never dull. It's never boring. There, it's a lot of things, but it's never that. And that's one of the things that I love about it. And honestly, so my, my year as a fellow in many ways is even more diverse than my years as a resident. Uh, but during my time as a resident, there would be times, especially when I was on call and you know, I would get to the hospital sometimes at five, five thirty in the morning and I wouldn't leave there until eight o'clock at night. And it would be a combination of admitting patients from the ER and rounding on patients on the floors and, um, doing any number of technological tasks, writing notes, getting orders in, talking to nurses, talking to physical therapists, talking to specialists from various fields, um, talking to my colleagues, doing some teaching for, with a medical student. And so really any day kind of holds so much and so much diversity. And another phrase that I have said to residents for a long time now too is, you know, our days feel like a thousand years sometimes and the years and everything else really feels short. The weeks feel short, the months feel short, the years feel short. Uh, but the days are really long and they're really full. And I think part of that is because we get to encounter people at really vulnerable moments. And we're often invited into sacred spaces that they don't really invite anybody else into. And it's not just that I spent five minutes with somebody, but spending five minutes with them might mean engaging one of the most fragile and sacred parts of who it is that they are. And it's such a privilege to get to do that. And it's also, it makes for very full days. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, it it depends on the day. So on on top of doing hospital work, I also do clinic work. Uh, So I see patients in our clinic that's actually just right across the street from Memorial Hospital. Uh, Again, really across the lifespan of folks, anything you can think of is something that could walk through our door. Uh, You know, in the midst of COVID, we have a respiratory hallway that we see patients on. I was working on our inpatient unit last week and saw plenty of patients with COVID. Um, So that's obviously added another layer of of newness uh, to the work and stretched all of us, I think, in a lot of different ways and ways that are exciting and ways that are hard. And yeah, and so honestly, no, no two days are the same. And I'm really grateful to have been trained in a place where people really welcome that diversity because I think that's what allows me to be at my best uh, is that day to day. I'm always being asked to do something else and, and getting to experience something novel. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I am thinking of um, for our Soren fellows who have had the privilege to have David Fagerberg for one theology class. He makes this distinction between chronological time, chronos and, and kairos, yeah. where, where there's a there, there's a, a depth of time perhaps within five minutes that is much more substantial than any greater amount of chronological time, whether it's 10 minutes or a day or a week or a year. And so when when you spoke about that, that's exactly what came to mind is that that depth of experience, that 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 depth of time. What are you packing into those five minutes beyond a very kind of uh, normal or mundane, you know, day or week or year? So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I want to touch on something that, that you brought up. So you, you talked about COVID. Um, and without, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be reduced to COVID, but it is a very kind of present example. You know, as someone of faith who is in, in the midst of suffering by the nature of your work, you know, how does the lens of faith play in your processing of just like perpetual encounters with the fragility of the human person, um, the fragility of who we are as created beings. And like, what are, I mean, what, what have been ways by which you've been able to kind of like see more fully or cope more, I don't know, um, sufficiently because of the eyes of faith that you bring to the context of suffering that might otherwise be um, kind of unintelligible to, to others? Yeah, 
Great question, Pete. I think probably the best way that I've found to, to, and this has really just come to me in the last kind of six to eight months of, of prayer. And honestly, I, I really suspect that COVID is a part of how I've just like how the language of this has, has settled into me in, in a fresh way. But I really feel like as a resident and, and I would argue really just as a physician, but honestly, as a person of faith, I get to show up at work every day and live the Paschal mystery. You know, like I live the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus over and over again. Uh, I live it myself. I live it through my patients. I live it in and with conversations with my colleagues. And honestly, I think without a sense that we have a God who loves us enough to come into the mess of our lives, to suffer with us, and to transform that suffering into something beautiful as a power that can then make all other suffering beautiful is really what allows me to have any sense of stability in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of any number of demands that just are put onto my plate in a day that, that feel hard to sort through that I personally don't feel sufficient to, to wrestle with and deal with that. I feel like my capacity is extended beyond. Mm. And that image of Jesus's, you know, life, suffering, death and resurrection is what I try as, as best I can. I certainly don't do this perfectly to continually come back to and say, man, like this is, this is the narrative that I find myself in. And, and not only that, not only is this the story, but in Jesus, we have an example of what it looks like to live out faithfulness and a life of love and joy and, and beauty in a way that is so crystallized and, and, and really are like, he tells us our clearest image of, of who the father is. And so, you know, I can remember walking to work and this must've been, I don't know, maybe about a year ago, actually, maybe a little shy of a year ago. And I was in the middle of a really tough call stretch and I had been on call the, the previous day and I was going to be on call that day. And I had another call the following day and I was walking into work at six o'clock in the morning after having slept, I don't know, four or five hours and thinking to myself, it was like, it was dark because it's South Bend, Indiana in November, you know, and uh, it was cold. And I was walking to work thinking to myself, I am so tired right now. And I have no idea how I'm even going to get through this day. And it, it crossed my mind that when Jesus was walking towards Calvary, he also hadn't slept at all and had barely eaten anything and was alone and in darkness, both physically and metaphorically and symbolically. And yet somehow in the midst of that, he was still kind. Mm. Every single person that he passes on the road as he walks towards his death, he is, he's not just pleasant or, you know, neutral towards, he demonstrates real kindness. He comforts the women of Jerusalem. He comforts his mother. He comforts the thief on the cross next to him, you know, and just acknowledging and, and, and really trying to take in this reality of, of Jesus's person and say, okay, I have no idea how I'm going to do this day. But if, if that's how Jesus did this and he, if he actually lives in me, if it's actually true that the spirit is alive in me, this is what's available to me, this kind of life and this kind of energy and this kind of approach to my work, not just to endure it or survive it or get through it, but to actually participate in God's redeeming work in the world in the midst of it. And I think that kind of lens and and hope is really what allows for my work hopefully to be transforming me into the likeness of Christ slowly, very slowly, but hopefully continually. Thank you so much, friend. Um, We covered so much um, and it's been such a rich conversation that I think it's a good time to pause. I'm sure we're getting questions from Soren fellows who are much more informed about um, the kind of day-to-day realities of preparing for med school and whatnot. So we'll get to those as soon as we can, but I do have to spring one last bonus question on you, which is a question that we ask all of our guests um, as well as Soren Fellows. Um, and it's it's a hypothetical, um, but so you're at a De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture tailgate in a COVID free time, um, and you're able to crack open a LaCroix or another 
adult beverage um, with anyone who's ever lived. Um, and you can sit with them under our tent and have some pulled pork and a LaCroix. Um, who are you Who are you cracking open a cold one with and why? Yeah, great question. So probably my answer to this would be a gentleman named Dallas Willard, who is a late professor and former minister, uh, worked as a philosophy professor at USC, actually, and then was in pastoral ministry in a lot of different ways prior to his work there. But he wrote a lot about formation, about Christian formation, about what it means to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. But he never really wrote about what that looks like within medicine, what that looks mm-hmm. like as a physician. And and all of, all of his work, I think, is translatable to the world of healthcare and the work of healing in the world. But I would love to pick his brain on what does it look like, particularly within this particular call and this particular mm-hmm. profession to live this transformation that you write mm-hmm. about? And mm-hmm. what are the challenges to that? What do you think are the resources and the tools that Jesus is teaching and his life offer that make that work possible in the way that he would want it done? What do you think is the way that he would want it done? Uh, what does that look like? So I would love to to have a conversation with him about that. Uh, that's that's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm going to flip the script on you a little bit and say what you would be asking uh, at the tailgate is exactly what you're offering to our Soren fellows tonight. Um, so um, I'm going to force you to accept that compliment um, and we'll, we'll end it there. But I look forward to continuing the conversation with uh, the questions that come in from Soren fellows. Uh, Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for the, the, the witness of your life, for being Christ to the most vulnerable here in South Bend and uh, look forward to catching up with you sometime soon. Thank you so much for the invitation. Take care. God bless. All right. Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this Integritas chat. Uh, and Kate, great to, great to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, and thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time. Glad to be with you all. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we've had some awesome questions come through, unsurprisingly. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it for the last 15 minutes that we have. Um, so um, this one comes from one of our Soren fellows. Um who asks, can you share a little bit about how you navigated relationships with peers in med school and even current colleagues who have differing views uh, than you, both with respect to kind of the specific instances of, say, patient treatment concerns, but also as well as like the, the big questions of like faith and morality that will kind of necessarily crop up in the context of care toward human persons? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think... I'll speak to the second half of that um, kind of in the lens of the first, honestly. So I think one of the great aspects of healthcare today is that generally speaking, um, there is an openness to public discourse about any number of things, um, certainly with regards to evidence-based therapies and how we should tackle a given problem and what it looks like to use best practices And honestly, I think in light of that, there's kind of an air of curiosity. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's an air of openness to engaging in things that maybe don't come naturally to me or aren't really obvious to me on first pass. And I think in light of that, that actually does open doors to conversations about faith that might not be possible without that atmosphere being the foundation for what we live in right now, which I do think is unique to our current age. I don't know that it was always that way, but I think that that's a benefit of living in the time that we live in right now. And I think specifically about, you know, questions of faith um, and and the ways that that comes up with regards to contraception and physician assisted suicide and any number of other hotly contested topics uh, in our world. What I found was that if I authentically lived as best I could, certainly not perfectly, but as best I could in light of Jesus's teachings and sought to live a life of love, actually my colleagues would ask me questions about that. I didn't even necessarily have to force those conversations. And I think that posture of curiosity is the best possible space to try to meet with someone, you know, on the other side of the fence on the other side of a given issue um, coming from a different perspective. And so I tried to also show that kind of curiosity 
towards my friends that had opposing views. Honestly, many of the folks that I engaged with, particularly at Vanderbilt, had very different views uh, than I did. You know, I, I mentioned when we talked a week ago about the seven people at the end of that line with me, and I would say, you know, five or six of them had pretty much diametrically opposed convictions about any number of topics. And um, many were either agnostics or atheists. And what I found was that just asking them questions about, because honestly, I looked at these friends and a lot of them lived the teachings of Christ better than I did. I, I watched them love loved their patients and loved each other in ways that were often hard for me. And so just saying to them, why do you do this? Why is caring about people so important to you? What drives you to value honoring another and seeking to love well? And those often opened doors for them to reciprocate the question and then for me to just share honestly and openly uh, and truly to learn from those folks. You know, I think that Notre Dame is a, it was a huge gift to me in that I was able to be formed in a context where I was built up into understanding deeply the foundations of what I believed. But I also think that there's a kind of learning and growth that can only come in being exposed to other perspectives and other worldviews and other questions. And I was so grateful for my colleagues at Vanderbilt that were constantly pushing me to think about these issues through a different lens and with a different perspective. And to honestly just acknowledge that whenever we're talking about real people, it's extraordinarily complicated. And that's not to say that we can't use principle and values to direct our thinking about things and direct our action. But I do think that it requires a kind of nuance. I think love requires a kind of nuance that really attends to the person in front of us. And that's just never as simple as saying, well, this is the kind of the ethical posture. And so let's just put that on the table. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of the way in which uh, a theologian here on campus, John Cavadini, talks about the witness of the saints um, and that, you know, it's it's not a set of first principles that they suggest um, kind of in, in a form of rationality or rational order that convinces someone of the truth of the gospel, let's say, and and the truths contained therein, whether it's in moral theology or philosophy or political theory or whatever, but it's actually just the witness of their own lives um, that personal sanctity is what appeals um, even beyond rational argumentation. And there is a certain kind of participation that that we have in that as you know Christians in whatever field that we're going to be in, whether it's medicine and there are these kind of bioethical questions that we're faced with, or we're in law and public policy and there are issues of the common good that we're faced with. Um, so much of what is the most effective kind of mode of communication is embodied um, rather than kind of dictated um, in some sense. And um, I, yeah, it just strikes me that that's so present to you in your work in medicine is that it's actually more of a process of encounter um, of another Christ, another Imago Dei to that of someone who is subject to principles X, Y, and Z. Um, so thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. Um, next question coming in from uh, Emma Nowak. Um, she has a question about um, discernment. Um, so she goes, uh, what advice do you have for how to sit with the tension of future career discernment, maintaining the balance between not rushing into one choice or the other, while also not remaining like frozen or taking any steps forward? So what's what's the, the balance there? Yeah, it's a great question. I and Discernment never stops. You think you like find your career and then your discernment is over for life. It's just not true. I'm discerning like five things right now, y'all. So, but what I, what I will say is I think we're not called to discern in isolation. I would highly recommend finding a spiritual director and being as open and honest with that individual as is human possible. Uh, in addition to that, I also have an accountability partner. So someone I meet with every week or two and just openly confess um, my sins and my growing edges with to allow that be a, to be a mirror unto kind of the things that Jesus is growing in me and the opportunities I have to live more fully into resurrection life. And honestly, those two practices help me sort out, is this a decision that is actually in line with what the spirit is doing in me? Or is this something that I just kind of concocted on my own and would like to pursue for any number of selfish reasons or selfish gains. And so I think establishing those practices is super important. 
And then I think really, this is another, just a great practice that one of my friends taught me. So she was, as a, as a child, would always sit right next to her dad at mass. And whenever the, the priest would consecrate the host, you know, often the priest is holding up the patent underneath the host and he would say, her dad would say to her, you know, you can put anything you want up there, whatever you want, a, a decision you have to make, some part of your life that just isn't going the way that you want it to go. And you can ask Jesus to transform that in just the same way that God transformed bread into Christ himself. So what would it look like for that thing that feels unresolved to actually be taken up into the life of Christ? Hmm. And so ever since she told me that story, the biggest decisions I've had to make in the last several years, that's been my posture of just trying to put that, to surrender that and put that on the patent to be transformed, transfigured into the likeness of Jesus. And so those practices of just surrendering over and over again, I think are what allow us to keep moving forward and not get stuck, but also not rush ahead and, mm -hmm. and kind of walk our own path. And so whatever allows you to move into that posture of surrender, I think that is the best way to go. And then also mm -hmm. the other thing that I would say about that is while I'm someone who really likes a linear like, I just want Jesus to tell me what to do. You know, I just want him to be very clear with me and say, this is what you're to do now and go do it. But oftentimes that's just not how the spirit works. And I think it's really important to return to this phrase that Jesus says often in the scriptures. That's I'm going to go with you, whatever you do, I will be with you. And so sometimes God is actually wanting us to just choose. And I think that's really important to remember, too. If I've surrendered this as fully as I can and I don't have some kind of very, you know, direct and clear cut response to what it is that I'm supposed to do, that actually is probably just an invitation of Jesus saying, I want you to be in relationship with me. I'm not interested in you being my puppet. I really want conversation, intimacy and relationship. And what that requires is for you to be a free being in our exchanges. And so you just need to choose. You've done the work of letting go as best you can and inviting me in. And now I'm telling you, you need to choose. And so I think recognizing that there are times when he says that to us. Thank you, friend. Yeah. Two things that you said really stick out to me. One is that a discernment doesn't happen in isolation. I mean, fundamentally, we are relational beings. I mean, this is like a basic kind of Trinitarian theology, like God in some sense is is relationship, right? And so our, our human nature in the Imago Dei uh, is made kind of most fully in the image of God while we're in relationship. Um, and so isolation isn't kind of, uh, a, isolationism in the context of discernment strikes me as kind of an unhelpful path forward. It's not, I have to, to figure this out on my own terms and it's according to my own merit and my own kind of fruit of prayer for me to, to decide how to how to discern what steps are, are next, but rather it happens in the context of communities. Um, and then the, the the second thing that you said is that, you know, um, God is not linear. Um, you know, even sometimes the way in which I think about my vocation or my professional development or like capital V vocation to marriage is like God is a God of surprises. Um, you know, you have to be willing to be surprised by God to actually answer yes. Um, it's not something you can calculate your way toward or kind of manipulate your way toward. Um, and that's very disarming for very high achieving students like you have at Notre Dame St. Mary's and Holy Cross, which is like, well, if I just get A plus B, I'll get C. Um, and that's just not simply the way God works. Um, so it is it is a kind of a, a perpetual surrender while also in the context of relationship. So easier said than done, of course. Um, <laughs> but okay, so we have, uh, I think, time for one, one more question from Ali, um, who asked, how does um, kind of big V vocation? Uh, so married life, religious life, kind of the, the call to that which you are beyond your profession, um, intersect with discernment into vocation as a ph physician. And so this could be either through your own life or even through the witness of other people who have kind of come into your life, um, who have also been physicians or discerning um, a professional career in, in medicine. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm single, uh, full disclosure, I'm single, I'm not in a relationship. I have no idea what God is calling me to with regards to singleness, religious life, marriage. I suspect that I will not be a religious, but you know, God can do whatever he wants. That said, I have loads of friends that are 
you know, some of whom are physicians and also sisters and others who are physicians and married with children. And, you know, I think, I think it's so hard and also so beautiful uh, to hold all of those things together. And ultimately, I think the most important thing is to know that we're held by Christ in that. Mm. And um, in light of that, probably the most helpful and concrete piece of advice that I've been given on this path with regards to that question came from a mentor of mine at Vanderbilt who is married with three children and his kind of hierarchy for decision-making and discernment has always been God, family, medicine. So he says that, that he walks around the hospital saying that over and over again, you know, it's God, then family, medicine. And I do think that there is a proper ordering to our vocations. That's super important. And to be honest, it, it becomes a little more complicated for me as a single person because the question of kind of who is my family comes up a lot. And I do think that ultimately, you know, my family is the body of Christ on a, mm-hmm. a global scale. Um, but it, it gets a little messy sometimes with where does work end, you know, and other life begin. And I will absolutely confess that I'm not immune to the idolatry of work by any means. Mm. But I do think, you know, that is again, a place where, you know, Allie making those decisions with regards to kind of these bigger vocations and then the vocation of medicine. I think it's so important to not put yourself in a vacuum when you're trying Mm. to make those really difficult decisions and to look to people that are living that path alongside you or ahead of you and to really try to garner input from them to say, how did this look for you? What are things that I can do to try to make this a a path that honors my family and honors the people that I feel most vowed to and most covenanted to? And I think honoring that as best we can, knowing that there's going to be mistakes. So we're going to, we're going to fumble sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, But ultimately also realizing that sometimes, you know, it's not like we figure out one of those vocations and then we move on to the next one. So often God is just weaving things together in ways that we rarely expect, which just means that he's in control. And so, um, yeah, I think this might sound overly simplistic, but my encouragement would be just keep living the next step of what's put in front of you and trust that God is going to sort out what layer of that needs to come first and the timing of it and how all that is going to fit together because more than likely whatever it is that you or I have imagined is just it just sells God short for for the fullness and the beauty of what he actually wants to be wow thank you friend and that I mean whether it's applied in medicine or in business or engineering or whatever walk of life that someone would find themselves in. I, I think that's just, I mean, that's just wisdom for a human person, no matter you're, you know, physician or, or not. Um, so thank you for being so um, transparent and, and kind in your response. Um, so we're pretty much out of time, but I'm going to end with a comment that we got from um, one of our senior Soren fellows at St. Mary's, who's actually a nursing student. Um, and I'm just going to end on this and it's going to be a, a little testament to how how good and holy you are, friend, um, and please accept the compliment. Um, so she goes, I'm a senior nursing major at St. Mary's, and I am at Memorial for clinical all semester. Thank you for sharing your story and experience. Your comments on living the Paschal mystery was particularly impactful. Thank you for all that you do. And I'm going to echo that, um, the, especially the Paschal mystery part. That was a revelation for me, no pun intended. Um, so Thank you, friend, um, for all that you do and all that you'll continue to do, um, especially for the most vulnerable in our community. And we'll look forward to when you can join us sometime in person here at the DeNicola Center. But thank you so much for joining us tonight and, and sharing so much of your story. Thanks, friend. Yeah, it's a gift and a pleasure. And thank you all for tuning in. Absolutely. Have a good night, Kate. Yep, you too. Take care. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.